Hiking the Inca Trail. Good morning and welcome. I'm sure you'll enjoy your visit to this archaeological site. One of the greatest mysteries of this site is the question of how it was built. How were the ancient people able to construct such spectacular buildings out of such heavy stones without the help of modern technology? We'll explore this and other mysteries pertaining to their culture during our tour today. Before we begin, let me go over a few restrictions. In order to preserve the site, we ask you to walk only on the network of paths, which is clearly marked. After the tour, you may walk around the site as you please, but remember that you can access the buildings only between 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. The grounds stay open until 6. You can access any building you wish on your own except for the ceremonial area. That building is open only to groups with guides, and we'll be visiting it on our tour today. If you haven't bought your tickets yet, please do so now. They're available over here at the counter, $15 for adults and $10 for children. After the tour is over, you might want to visit our gift shop, where we have an array of native crafts for sale. What is ecotourism? Good afternoon, excellent eco tours. Oh, uh, hello. Yes, I have a vacation coming up and I haven't taken a pleasure trip in a long time. I'm interested in eco tourism. Can you tell me about any trips you have coming up soon? My vacation is in January. I'd be happy to help you. Let me just take down your information. What's your name, please? Bob Henderson. What kind of tour are you interested in? Our most popular tours are the Wilderness Adventure Tour and the Local Culture Tour. Tell me more about the first one. That's a nature tour. We take you to a remote area of the rainforest where you learn all about the local plants and animals. It sounds interesting, but I'm a little wary of tours that feature wild animals. Don't worry. You'll be in the hands of experts, and everything will be perfectly safe. Also, there will always be a barrier between you and the animals. It sounds like an interesting trip. It is. Shall I sign you up for the Wilderness Adventure Tour, then? Yes. Uh, what are the dates? January 12th through the 25th. That sounds perfect. I have a question about the accommodations. What are they like? There are two types. You have a choice between a fairly basic hotel or camping at the campground. Oh, I definitely prefer the campground. Great. I'll put you down for that. Now, do you mind if I ask you something? How did you hear about our company? Did you see our publicity somewhere? Yes, I saw it in a travel magazine. Learning Vacations Good afternoon. Learning Vacations Limited. May I help you? I'm interested in taking a learning vacation. I understand you organize vacations with painting classes. We do. We offer learning trips for a broad range of tastes and interests, and painting trips are among the most popular. Do you have a particular destination in mind? Not really. I just like to go someplace pretty with colorful scenery for painting and maybe some nice ocean breezes. Then you would probably be interested in our painting trip this summer. You spend two weeks at a beach resort in Mexico and attend painting classes under the supervision of university art professors. University professors? That's impressive. Yes. The trip is sponsored by the art department at Springfield University. It's part of their summer school. That sounds great. My other interest is international cuisine. Do you have any cooking trips? We certainly do. However, I don't know whether you'd be interested because almost all our cooking trips take place in a city, not by the ocean. Our clients get to enrol in ongoing cooking classes at the National Cooking Institute, which sponsors the trips. So I would really learn to cook, not just watch someone else cook? Yes. You learn how to choose ingredients, how to prepare them, everything. 
What are the accommodations like? Would I stay at a hotel? No, for the cooking trip, participants stay at a residential college that's close to the National Cooking Institute. I think either one of those trips would suit my taste. You need to decide soon. You'll have to enrol in the class of your choice, and then we make the travel arrangements for you. When would I have to decide? Enrolment for the painting classes ends on June fifteenth, and for the cooking classes on July first. Thanks. I'll let you know soon. What makes a small business successful? Okay, so our assignment for our business class is to explain the reasons for the success of a particular small business.、Uh, we agreed to use the Sunshine Bakery for our model, right? Yes, it's a good example of several of the characteristics that are typical of successful small businesses. For one thing, it has its own particular niche. Uh huh. Because there are no other bakeries in the neighborhood. Right. So even though its product isn't unique, it just sells normal baked goods. There aren't any competitors in the area. Yes, I think that's a vital part of its success, and its product is really good. So it already has a great reputation. Everybody knows about the delicious bread you can get there. So it has lots of customers. I don't remember reading anything about market research that the owners did before opening the business, but I guess it doesn't matter because there are lots of customers now. But the owners did start with a sound business plan. I mean, they projected all their expenses and how long it would take to start earning a profit and all that. Right, and the business became profitable in about two years. I think that's pretty good. And since they had enough financial support to start off with, they were able to keep the business afloat until then. Okay, so let's start writing up these ideas for our report. Brand loyalty. We'll talk today about promoting new products. Your main goal in promoting your products is to create brand loyalty, a bond between you and your customers. That way, your customers will keep coming back to you. How do you do this? The main point is to make your customers feel that your brand is somehow special, so that they'll feel special when they buy it. They want to feel that using products with your brand gives them status. A common method is to get endorsements from famous people. Customers will think, if I use the same brand as that movie star or athlete or television actor. Then I'll be as special as that person. This also gives the idea that your brand is bought by selective people, which makes customers feel very good about buying it themselves. If you can make customers feel passionate about your brand, then they'll always buy it, whether your products are common household staples or expensive luxury items. This is what you want. A brand loyalty that's hard to reverse. Global outsourcing. Welcome to the Apex Factory Tour. Let's begin with a little history of the factory. The Apex manufacturing firm has been in existence since 1900, when the company built the first factory right here on this site. It was quite a boon to the local economy, since it was the first factory in this region. In fact, Apex was at the epicenter of manufacturing in this region for many, many years. Business was so good that in 1910, the firm's owners decided to add a night shift in order to keep the factory operating 24 hours a day. As you can imagine, the firm's owners became quite wealthy. The first branch factory was built in 1915. In 1940, the original old factory was completely torn down and replaced with a new, larger one on the same site. That's the building we're standing in now. Over the years, there have been a number of changes, of course. Then came 1998, which was perhaps the most decisive year for the company. 
the decision had to be made about outsourcing some of the labor, as many other companies were doing and are doing. The firm's owners ultimately decided not to do so. That decision means that at the present time, Apex remains a major employer in this region. There's a high level of satisfaction among our staff, as shown by the fact that our employee turnover is quite low. Social networking. Let's talk today about the online social networking trend. There's been an explosion of interest in this form of communication. What effects do you think this will have on our lives as the trend unfolds? It's clear that the advantages are immense. Think about it. These online social networking sites make it possible to have contact with people all over the world. I agree. You can pursue all kinds of opportunities, both personal and professional, through social networking. You can make friends. You can find jobs. You can exchange all kinds of information with people everywhere. It really expands your world. These are important advantages, but do you also see any disadvantages to this phenomenon? What might be some of the negative consequences? I see that in one way it expands your world, but in another way it hurts it. I mean, you might spend so much time with your online friends that you don't pay attention to your local friends and family. It can mean the loss of your local community. There are also dangers with your online community. You can make many acquaintances online. But you don't necessarily know a lot about them. You might not know their true identity. Why are women leaving science careers? Welcome to the Robertson Research Lab. On our tour today, you'll see where researchers work, and you'll learn what scientific research is all about. Today. The Robertson Research Lab is one of the most important labs devoted to scientific research in the country, but it took a long struggle for the lab to gain the status that it enjoys today in the scientific and academic communities. It required an inordinate effort to get the support necessary to build the lab. In fact, it took approximately ten years to collect enough funding to start construction. That would not have been possible without the invaluable help of a number of individuals whose names are listed here on this wall. Although much of the funding came from government resources, and of course some of it also came from the Robertson family, the lab is located here at the university, and it's the university that bears the responsibility for maintaining and running the lab. In fact. One purpose of the lab is to give university students experience with research. Professional research scientists at the lab provide guidance to science students as they design and carry out their own research studies. Wheelchair accessibility issues. We have to plan our report on wheelchair accessibility in this building. The professor wanted us to see what accommodations are already in place and what changes need to be made. Right. So the first thing we need to do is walk around the building and see what's here. We've already done some of that. I have anyway. I measured the corridors, and they're wide enough to accommodate wheelchairs. That's good to know because I measured some doors, both exterior and interior, and none of them has the necessary width. Then that's the first recommendation we'll have to make: wider doors. I think the building's exterior is fine. There's a ramp at the front entrance, so wheelchairs can get inside the building easily. That's true, but didn't you notice that there aren't any curb cuts? The curb is too high for a wheelchair to get over. So there's a parking place for disabled people in front of the building, but they still can't get a wheelchair over the curb and onto the sidewalk. Yeah, I guess that really would be a problem. So we'll have to recommend curb cuts. The building already has an elevator, so wheelchairs can get to all the floors. Right. So elevators aren't a problem. 
What about the light switches? Are they low enough on the walls? Yes, I tested some of them by sitting in a chair. They're low enough to reach. Learning styles. As teachers, when you plan your lessons, you'll need to keep in mind the different learning styles of your students. Remember that visual learners need to see things. Allow them to sit where they can easily see your face as you give the lesson. Remove any obstructions that might prevent this. Include visual items such as diagrams and pictures in your lesson to address the needs of these students. Auditory learners need to hear things. When they read, they may want to hear the words as well as see them. So allow them to read aloud and to recite information they're studying. Don't hinder their learning by requiring them to keep quiet during study time. Kinesthetic learners need to do things. To help these students, include activities that give them opportunities to move around and to manipulate items. While students may have different learning styles, they all have one thing in common: the need for frequent encouragement. The homeschool option. Welcome to the City Homeschooling Association. Most of you are interested in homeschooling your children, and I know you have many concerns and questions about how to begin. I'll start by explaining to you the legal requirements for homeschoolers in our city, and then in the latter part of the program, you'll have a chance to ask questions. There are certain things that are compulsory for homeschoolers in our city. First, to start. You'll need to inform the city that you plan to homeschool your children. Many people think that they'll have to hire professional tutors for their children, but that isn't required. Nor do you need to have prior teaching experience yourself. You do, however, have to follow an educational program mandated by the city, which addresses all the same subjects that are taught in the local schools. The city can provide you with textbooks, but even though the vast majority of families choose to use these books, they aren't required. You can use any books you want as long as you follow the city's program. Periodic tests, usually twice a year, are required by the city. You can give them to your children in your home and send them to the board of education for scoring. It's easy to do and doesn't cost any money. At the end of the school year, you have to submit a report to the city, which is also simple to do. It's a short report, and the city provides you with easy-to-follow guidelines. Homeschooling is no longer considered a novel idea, but is becoming more widespread. There are a lot of experienced families around who can help you get started. Educating the gifted. I asked you to read an article about recognizing gifted students in the classroom. So tell me, how can a teacher recognize gifted children? One thing gifted children do is read. They usually read books for older children, or sometimes books for adults. Yes, that's an important sign. Profoundly gifted children, especially, may be seen reading adult books at a very early age. What else? When it comes to problem solving, gifted children use sophisticated approaches, unlike their peers. Not all the signs of giftedness are positive. Gifted children might be bored in the classroom and behave badly. They often need help with discipline. That's exactly right. And one reason why it's so important to recognize these children and place them in the proper environment and give them the support they need. One way to support them is to give them constructive activities that are interesting to them. If they don't have activities that satisfy their inquisitiveness and creativity, that's when discipline can become a problem. And of course, we need to provide a special curriculum for these children. They need more than just some interesting activities. They need a whole course of study that matches their abilities. The development of the light bulb.
When you have an invention that you think you can sell, you have to protect it. You must get a patent so that there will be no infringement on your rights to produce and sell the device you've invented. The first thing you must do is find out if anyone else has a patent on a similar type of invention. This is called a patent search. Often, people hire specialized lawyers to do this for them. Once you've ascertained that there are no patents on inventions similar to yours, then you can get an application and file it with the patent office. Generally, you'll have to pay a fee when you send in the application. Next, you can start looking for investors. This is critical. Inventors tend to be solitary people and don't give much thought to finding financial backers to help them. However, if you want to successfully market your invention, you'll need people to provide money to start production and begin marketing. You'll need to think like an entrepreneur. Inspiration is not enough. Hard work and money are important ingredients for success. The invention of variable pitch propellers. That was a fascinating flight we saw. Now we have to write up the report for the school newspaper. Okay. Well, we should start with the name of the designer of the plane. Right. I'll just write that down. The designer was Steve Wilson, and the pilot's name was Joe Applewood. What about the names of the passengers? Did you get those? No, but there were two of them. We can just put that. We don't need their names. We should say something about the design of the plane, like the size of the propeller. How big was it? I'm not sure. It was big, but I couldn't say the exact size. Well, we should say something about it. What about the speed of rotation? How fast did that propeller move? I don't know. If we'd had a chance to confer with the pilot, we could have found out. But he left too quickly. Okay, so we can't include that information. We'll have to write more about the flight. It was a really prolonged flight. Yeah, he was cruising up there for at least thirty minutes, a lot longer than I expected. So write that down. And what a flexible machine! It handled the turns really well. Yeah, especially considering the weather conditions. It was so windy and cloudy. There must have been some turbulence. There probably was. We'll put that in the report too. The transatlantic cable. Welcome to the City Museum of Invention. We'll begin our tour with a brief overview of the history of the museum. This museum first opened its doors in 1985, the result of years of effort by the mayor and others in our city. In 1975, the city's mayor first got the idea to start a museum about inventions. After he got several experts interested, he set out to rally the necessary funds. In 1976, several events were held to raise the requisite amount of money to begin construction of a building to house the museum. They had almost raised enough money when there was an unexpected setback. A family that had promised a large percentage of the needed funds inexplicably withdrew their offer. It was toward the end of 1977 that this large gift was lost. Although there was an inquiry, it was never made clear why the funds were withdrawn. Plans for the museum were put aside for five or six years, but a group of interested people renewed the efforts, and by 1982, they had rallied enough monetary support to go ahead with the plans. That year, construction on the building began. In just under three years, the museum was completed, the result of the perseverance of a number of dedicated people. The museum continues to be a popular part of our city's culture. Although everything in the museum follows the theme of inventions, the variety of the exhibits will appeal to visitors of disparate interests. Our most popular exhibit, which is all about cable TV, was first opened in 1998. Thank <laughs> you.